In this video we're going to take the house that we modelled in the last few videos and that we blew up in um, rigid bodies and we're going to add an explosion to it. And uh, we're going to keep with the theme of keeping everything done in SOPs here with the SOP solvers. So we're going to use the Pyro SOP solver. The uh, plus side of that is I can keep everything separate and cache it separately. The downside is uh, that we won't get um, coupled behaviour. What I mean by that is the smoke effect in the uh, bricks as much as the bricks affect the smoke. It's a one-way behaviour thing, we'll have to simulate them separately, but we can do some tricks to make them look like they're working together. So um, what I'm going to do first off is uh, create an explosion and then once we've done that we'll wire the explosion in here and get that explosion to kind of drive the simulation and uh, then we'll kind of feed that back into the uh, pyro simulation to kind of collide with it so it kind of looks like both were happening at the same time. So in order to do that, I want to source my um, explosion from somewhere. So I'm going to start with a circle. So I'm going to hit tab and type circle. And then I'm going to tap P to get up the parameter interface, the uh, parameter uh, pane here. And I'm going to, where's my circle? Let me just template the circle and just uh, show the circle rather and template the uh, building there. And uh, I want it to lie, to lie on the ground. So I'm going to put it on the ZX plane here. And um, let's maybe move it back a little bit from the front there, something we can position that a bit later. Um, and then what I'm going to do is um, I want to create a point for the source of my explosion. So we'll create a scatter node. And uh, for now, we'll stick one point in there. And um, I'm going to use uh, a new system here for 18.5. and. Uh, that's called the Pyro Burst Source Node. If you hit tab actually and you look in the Pyro tools, you'll see there's a whole bunch of new tools for 18.5. Um, they're basically higher level tools that would save you building um, stuff that you tend to build often. I'll give you an example. Um, when we tend to do Pyro, we'll start with a point, and normally what I'd do is um, I'd have a particle system birth loads of points off here in the shape of the explosion I want, and then I'd feed that into the Pyro sim. So uh, a lot of these nodes will do that for us. Um, some really interesting ones you might want to play with this with this are the uh, burst source here and the uh, trail source. The trail will create trails and the burst will create sort of a, a big explosion. We're going to use the burst source for this example. But if you want to see them in action, you can actually try out... Um, oh, where, where did we go there? You can try out these guys at the bottom here. And uh, they're, they're sort of pre-setups of everything... Um, all the bangs and whistles in there so you can see how to set them up and play with them so they're good examples to mess around with but um, as I mentioned we're going to use the pyro burst source here so let's drop one in and see what it does for us so I'm just going to plug it in and turn it on for a minute and uh, what you'll see it gives a, a little burst thing here let's just make sure that's inside the house yep that's going to stay pretty much inside the house so if I step forward, you'll see it gives this sort of big particle burst. Oh, but there you go. Now the house explodes. So I'm quite happy with the scale of that. I'm going to turn off the templating of the house. So what you'll see is if we drag the slider, we get this sort of growing particles of multicolors. And uh, if we middle click, we get a, you'll see we get a bunch of attributes on these points, like burn and temperature. And uh, we've got a bunch of settings here that can control this. And uh, eventually we'll feed this through into our pyro sim. And... Um, that will that will be our source, and um, so let's have a look at how this might work. So there's quite a few tabs here that we can deal with. First, obviously, is initial size. We can kind of have it bigger or smaller if we want, and um, I'm going to leave it for that at the minute. And then we can sort of orientate the direction here. You'll see it's kind of facing upwards in this y-axis. So if I change this to the x-axis, you'll see it sort of faces along the x there. Let's uh, leave that about back along the y. And then we have a spread angle, it's how much it spreads along that axis. You turn that off and you'll see it's effectively a cone. And then we spread sort of these multiple cones out. And if you say 180 degrees, you get a nice sort of starburst effect. But we're on the ground here, so I'm going to put 90 in. And we can also change the roundness of the shape. And you can preview the shape up here in the guide as a proxy, uh, with the proxy shape here. And this sort of shows you the... Um, a convex hole based around all of your um, points there. And again, it shows you sort of the roundness or uh, an idea of the shape and also the direction there. You've got the little arrow which shows you the direction it's uh, pointing in. 
let's just turn that off for a minute so uh, you can make that round more round or more jaggedy if you want uh, and then we've got an offset here just to give you a variation of um, the different noises so if you've got a few in there you can just make sure you've got different shapes then down here we have a number of trailings this is how many of those little cones we're getting let's bring that down to one so we can see what a single cone looks like there we go and um, this, tr this separation here is the distance between the points if I bring that lower we'll get a lot more points there so we get a higher sort of fidelity or high resolution um, uh, sourcing uh, points for sourcing uh, and then we can adjust the trail length so if I shrink that or extend that we can kind of make this kind of shooting off little trail thing again I'd leave that for the uh, trail source which is the other way of doing stuff which is uh, if we just look in the uh, RBD in the uh, pyro here it's this one here the trail source that will give you nice sort of trailing rocket bursts but um, we're not going to look at that in this tutorial so um, we've also got the trailing thickness where we can make that uh, wider or smaller or the cones in general so I'm going to kind of um, let's just pop back let's put back in here the 250 back to the defaults um, those are pretty good for down here now there's an, uh, another thing that we can do with this that's really interesting we can add some variations I've just got my explosion um, happening on the one frame here so um, yep let me just uh, show you um, what we can do at these variation side at these sides here with these options here um, what I'm going to do is make my circle big let's go uh, sort of 10 by 10 and I'm going to put three scatter points in so we've got more than one point in there we can see our three explosions maybe make this 8 by 8 so a bit closer together there we go so they look um, fairly similar so um, what we can do is uh, we can actually vary the inputs coming in so uh, one way to do that if we have this on set uniform they all get the same sort of value they're all the same size of one if we set this to set varying then we can create some variation around that so at the moment you'll see we've got one and this variation of 0.25 if I put the variation up higher you'll see we get a, a much more randomness between uh, the three choices that we get and obviously if you change the seed it just uh, changes that randomness for you so you can create some randomness um, like that which is pretty nice I'm going to put that to one so they're similar sizes they're not too big so if you've got lots of these you can have lots of different explosions at different sizes and things and again um, we could maybe do this on the angle here so I'm going to do this to uh, set varying and then uh, we'll sort of have it within five degrees of this angle here so um, we're getting some I mean if you make that quite a lot you'll see it just tilts it around the axis so it's just five degrees around the Y it's a bit of a, a wobble in there and then um, yeah we'll leave the uh, spread angle I think and uh, maybe just play of the offset something like that looks interesting so you can go in and put lots of variation here now um, if we go to the burst animation we can also offset the start frame here so there you can sculpt the shape so here we can uh, offset the start frame let's maybe make this start on frame 3 So as I jump forwards we'll see if we go to uh, frame 3 they all appear but again this is a useful one to add some variation in and um, again we could use set varying and we could sort of vary the start time between 3 and you see we get a nice offset there or we could actually control this a bit more um, in a more controlled manner and you can do this with all of these guys look we can set an attribute here as well so I'm going to change this to use attribute so it's going to expect an attribute um, on our points which will control this and that way we can specif uh, specify exactly what numbers that we want so um, what attribute name do we use well if you hold your cursor over here you'll see it says in parameter start frame all in lowercase that's the name of the attribute we want but um, we can automatically make that with these nodes now on the right hand side here you'll see this uh, dice icon if you click on it, it makes a really nice attribute adjust float node for you and this node if you middle click creates that attribute for us start frame because we made it from that um, button here it knows which attribute you want and um, you can change the settings if you want here now let me just right click and bring up the spreadsheet and we can see our start frame here is ja um, staggered now we've got um, five six five and six there we go so we see two on five and one on six 
Now, the way this works is uh, we're just setting a minimum value here. Uh, that's this. So the minimum one we're going to get is 3. And then we're going to get any number up to plus 3, so minimum plus range. So that's between 3 and 6. And we can see those values there. Uh, I might put a 4 in here to have that go between 3 and 7. I know they've all got the same value. Never mind, I'll just change the seed until I get something I like. Uh, I want them on different frames there. So oh, there's that one. So we'll just change the seed till we get one that we like. There you go, 4, 7 and 6. So we'll get bang, 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 that kind of thing. And uh, it's choosing a random number, but you could get it to choose from a noise. And uh, we can either set always, or we can add or subtract or multiply it to an existing number if the attribute was already there. And you can change the method as well. You don't need a minimum value, which I quite like. Um, you could use min max values, and it'll choose a number in between. Or you could specify middle value and a plus or minus either side of that. So it's up to you, um, and you can obviously change the distribution of that randomness here. So it's quite cool that you can uh, do that, and as you see, on you can do that for all of these properties here. You can do set varying or use attribute. So that's kind of cool. I've got my little poppiness there. So if you wanted to do that sort of line of carpet bomb, bomb type things, you could obviously have, e obviously have each point with a, a sequential number. You could link point number, for example, to the frame number to the start frame rather and then you'd have that sequential line of explosions. Um, I want these to be quite quick actually so we can adjust the frame duration let's make that three uh, so they happen quite fast so uh, you know what nice quick pop on those and uh, we've got this other thing here we've got this outward expansion you'll see as they grow they kind of expand outwards we can increase that expansion outwards or decrease it. So that's the kind of size that it would go to. Um, I'm going to have them come a little bit less, maybe 2.5. And then we can have some directional expansion. You know, we'll push them in the direction that we specify up here in the direction. So up towards the Y there. So we can stretch them a little bit. And um, it, they scale up. These two scale up according to this ramp. So this is over the three seconds. So it'll start off small. It'll get up to scale quite quickly. I mean, we could move this um, over here and have it scale up really slowly at the last minute. So, or you can control that how you like. So there we go. We kind of got this nice sort of poppy expansiveness there. Um, I'm going to drop this back down to uh, one by one, so these will happen quite close together. This kind of thing, and uh, I might just set this back to one for the minute, just so we see the one explosion. Because uh, what I want to do is go to the uh, burst components here and um, just talk about the uh, components it's creating. And the components basically are these attributes. And as we know, these attributes are going to drive the simulation. And at the moment, we're just uh, creating a burn field and a temperature field. And we can see those uh, represented by these two tabs here. So there's where we're creating the burn, and here's our temperature. Now if we turn off the temperature field, we'll see the burn field is represented by these yellow particles and the temperature was uh, represented by the blue. And if you add other fields, they've got their own colours as we'll see as we go along. But this shows us kind of the value that we've got in our burn field. Let me turn this on. Now the secret to good pyro is not having uniform stuff. It's not just um, a uniform emission of points here, which we've got quite a non-uniform emission of points, but it's also a uh, non-uniform values in the fields as well. So we can kind of break this up. And uh, this is why they're colored, so you can preview this. For example, we could add some noise. And you'll see the black areas, we've got zero there. I don't really want zero, so I'm going to bring the amplitude down to maybe 0.5. So the smallest will get a sort of a 0.5 value of burn. So it's just breaking that up. And then we can change the size of the noise pattern here as well. I'm going to make that a little bit bigger, just to make it a bit patchy. So it's patchy as it expands and uh, uh, blows up like that. So it's, it's quite nice to add noise I think to these things. It really helps sort of um, give you that nice initial thing. Um, we can also do some funky stuff here as well. Um, we can scale it over the duration. So if I turn that on, what you'll see is as I drag through it actually scales the burn as it gets bigger. So as we get really bigger here there's a lot less burn so it's mostly at the beginning and fades off. If I turn that off, it's just constant all the way through to the end here, which means you can get really hot flames there. Um, I quite like the fade off there. It gives you that initial burst, and then you can see the flames sort of die away. 
and you can control that ramp here um, using this you can make it fade off a bit three seconds is a very short space of time so you'll see I'm f uh, affecting the ramp there oh, let's uh, scale over duration so yeah you can see I'm affecting the ramp the uh, fade off with this ramp here so um, not only can we fade it off over duration, let me turn that off, we can fade it along the trailings here. So you'll see along the length of each of those cones, it's fading off to zero. So the burn's mostly at the middle here, and it kind of thins out as the cone thins out. Again, that gives quite a nice effect. So I'm actually going to turn both on here. So we start off with that nice burn, and it sort of fades off as we go through time. And this affects all the fields below here, inc and including, let's turn on the temperature. And you'll see the temperature is represented by that blue field. I'm going to leave the temperature fairly constant here. I'm not going to add any noise to that. We'll see how it goes. So um, the last interesting thing um, we can do with this thing, with this um, sourcing, is in the output attributes here, for example. So here we can change some other stuff, and we can add some noise to the velocities. If I just turn on the velocities here, you'll see they're just streaking out in the straight lines here which you might want, but I want to create some turbulence, some initial turbulence in here to create some um, interest. So I'll just turn this on for a minute, and you see it creates some noise around those vectors there. And again, you can adjust the amplitude or the size of that if you want to. Um, uh, yep, you can do the visualizer there. It's a bit nuts. I like to do this one, really. <laughs> but yeah, so we've added some uh, velo uh, noise to our velocity there. So we've got a very interesting sort of explosive thing here but we want to know how that might look so in order to see how that looks really let me put my scatter points back up to three so we've got these uh, three guys working over time there so in order to uh, preview this what we really need to do is um, drop in our pyro sop solver now in What's really good about these sort of no, new higher level nodes is not only do they, do they create these nice setups, they give us these little quick setup buttons at the top here. So this initialize button will set up some of the parameters here for us. And you'll see the default was set uniform. So if you choose set uniform, it will do that. But if you choose yet, uh, use attribute, it will set up these buttons for you. Um, I just pref I prefer not to do that. I just choose the varying set varying or attributes as I go along. But the bit I do use actually is these quick setups here. Um, there's a few things you can do. Um, I'm going to choose the pyro simulation. The source volume will just create the uh, volume rasterize attributes, whereas this will create the entire volume for you, whereas this will create a single point coming in for you at the top of the node, and they'll do various things. So we want to create pyro simulation here, and this will create the uh, volume rasterize node and the simple fireball setup for us. So this node here, the volume rasterize, if we middle click, you'll see it's turning our burn and our temperature and our velocity fields into actual volumes. So if we scroll through a bit, we'll see the volume there. And uh, you'll see it's linked down here to our actual pyro burst source, and that's how it knows which attributes to plug in. Normally you'd have to put these in manually, and it's adjusting the resolution here from the uh, particle separation that you would have done in this bit here, the resolution. So this is controlling the uh, fidelity of those these um, trails. So if you want higher resolution, you can just drop this particle separation down, and you'll see you get a better definition of your points there. That will slow it down a little bit, the sourcing. Um, but that's fine. Let's see how slow that's got now. Not too slow. <laughs> Not too bad. Cool. So um, let's go to the uh, Pyro Simple Fireball here. So at the moment it's using, um, if we turn it on and press play, we're using the sparse solver as opposed to the dense solver, um, which means uh, we're not actually using the whole box, we're just creating the voxels where we need them to be, and uh, it does the resize around it. And it's, uh, it can be a, uh, quicker in some cases, but there's, a re again, a really nice new feature of Houdini 18.5, and that is the minimal solve. And uh, the idea of the minimal solve is that you can fine-tune your look fairly, fairly quickly, and then when you come to do the final render, you do a proper solve. Um, the, you can be f it can be found here in the Solving tab, in the Advanced tab. Here it is, Minimal Open CL Solve. When we turn it on, you'll see um, a bunch of things get greyed out, and it takes a second or two to work. Now, it's called Minimal because it cuts down on a lot of these features, so it can run entirely on the GPU.
which makes it very very quick look if I press play now you'll see it goes very very fast but um, there's a few things you'll notice first of all things are turned off things like this advection reflection that you probably want and stuff um, like I said it does say minimal <laughs> that's the clue so it can go fast um, but it's good enough that you can tune in your look and your shape and all the rest of it very very quickly which is the advantage of it um, the, the differences are as you'll notice there's no cache here you have to go back to frame one and press play and it doesn't resize even though it's very very quick that's because it has to load everything um, into the GPU at the beginning and then it can play as fast as it can without having to load anything else in in or out and there's a few caveats to that um, I'll just demonstrate those in fact let me put my circle here back to 8 by 8 so it's a bit wider I'll just wait for the source to catch up there and if I go to the uh, fireball here let's just press play and you'll see oh that's not big enough so um, so we can see that on an 8 by 8 circle let me just make the circle big um, the first thing we need to do is resize this box it doesn't resize because it's loading all of these voxels into the GPU so we need to make this domain bigger so we can click on setup here and change it here in max size so I'm going to put something like maybe 35 um, 30 by 35 and um, I'm going to treat the Y boundary as closed below this will just clip the flames but that's fine because they're going to be eventually in, hidden inside the house um, just makes it a bit more efficient and uh, we can play with the resolution there as well which we'll do in a minute and you see now we can see how three explosions happening inside the box because I've got a lot more voxels it's a lot slower now be warned um, you're limited to the, G the RAM on your GPU your VRAM so if you make your size too big or your voxels too small um, you'll get an open CL warning error uh, which is fine let's put 0 0.05 in just to see that there we go so this will pop up telling you you've run out of RAM um, I've only got 6 gig myself so um, it's a little bit limited to the GPU RAM that you've got but um, it's fine enough to tune the look so you've just got to find that sweet spot of size versus resolution the other thing you'll notice actually it doesn't put out half the data that you would need for a proper solve anyway so um, it is really only for preview but that's good enough so let's maybe make this 30 by 30 just so it will go a little quicker so it doesn't resize, you have to resize it to the right size to make sure it all fits in RAM to begin with uh, and then you can't cache either but there's um, a few things you uh, want to know as well so if we go to the sourcing tab here this is important and this is just for the minimal C open CL source uh, the middle open CL solve rather so um, like I said it has to load everything in on the first frame and that includes the sourcing or any collisions that you might have and if you remember our sourcings here if I go to the spreadsheet are happening on frames 4, 6 and 7 now here's the source frame range it's going to load in the first 12 frames of your source so if you make a change that's why it takes a second or two to do anything because it's actually caching up these 12 frames and then it's loading them all into the GPU so if you've got a lot of sourcing or heavy collisions and they take a long time to process it'll take a while to do all those 12 frames so I'll show you what I mean if I put this to frame um, let's just see what, where it started so we did 4, 6 and 7 so if I ooh, um, only load in the uh, first 3 frames and press play you'll see we actually missed the sourcing because we're only loading in the first three frames of the input here if I do four we should get our first explosion if I do six oh, let's go back to frame one so if I do six then we'll get the two explosions and then if I do seven I'll get my three explosions but remember the explosion lasts more than um, one frame that's why we only get a little one there so I should put um, they were lasting three frames weren't they so I should put 10 in just to make sure I get the full length and you see it takes a second there while it had to use the volume rasterize and cache that up but now we get our proper sourcing I'll put it back to the 12 so this is just to make sure that you capture all the uh, you need to make sure that you get enough frames to capture all your sourcing coming in or your collisions if you're using them now the cycle length here it gets to loop um, if I put maybe 20 in every 20 frames it's going to loop so there you go on frame 40 it'll go off again and on frame 60 we'll get more explosions again the idea is that you can just keep playing here and interactively change these settings and just have it loop over and over again things will accumulate obviously in your in your box here
The other thing you can do actually, if you go to the edit menu, in fact you must do this, is you must turn on live parameter display during feedback. So you need to turn this on. When you turn that on, it means you can live change these values. So let me put 0.75 in the time scale, and you'll see it has a direct effect there, it slowed it down. Um, there's some settings that aren't live, things like resolution and stuff, you have to wait till you go back to the first frame so it can reload in the box, but the rest of these settings you can do live. So you see that slowed, slowed down the uh, explosion there a little bit. So this is a really cool way of tuning the look. I'm actually going to turn off, um, let me just stop that for a sec. So I'm just going to make enough of the cycles that it doesn't loop. Let's make that 120. And I'm going to come back up here and shrink my circle back to a small size so it's definitely within inside the house there. So again it's just having to load up those first few frames. And then we'll do our explosion there. And we'll see my box is a lot bigger, so I can probably shrink it down now. Let's maybe do 25 by 25. We'll see how that goes. There we go. We can get away with a bit more. And look, I can maybe drop the resolution down. We'll see it's a little slower. But then again, I am recording video on the GPU in the background here, as well as uh, trying to process stuff. So there we go. Now we can, uh, let me put the resolution back up, the voxel size, make that bigger so it got a little bit quicker for us. So we're going to talk about some of these settings here. So we can, uh, now we're in a position to fine tune our look. In fact, let me try and make this a little bit smaller again, just for speed. So 20 by 20. There we go. So if I go to the solving tab, first of all we saw the time scale. We can you know slow down the apparent explosion. If I put it at point one, you'll see it evolves really slowly. And if I put it at three, it should happen very quickly. There you go, it missed it. Let me go back to frame one. There you go, things happen very fast. I'm gonna slow this down a little bit actually to give it a sense of majesty um when it explodes there. So um, the next thing we can do, I can talk about actually, is this temperature diffusion. If I put this up high, you'll see it actually blurs the temperature field and you lose all that lovely detail that we fight hard to get. Um, sometimes the, um, if you get some artifacts, you can put small numbers of this in to kind of blur and soften that out. But I tend to, I tend to just up the resolution and try not to use that. In fact, the other thing is um, if you're displaying your pyro here, is uh, you must go to the display settings in the viewport. If you click on the eyeball here or tap D with your cursor over the 3D view, you'll get the display options here. If you go to the texture options here, you must turn off limit resolution. Um, I don't know if I hit the resolution, the uh, limit yet. If you turn this off, then you'll get the full glory of your high res sims in the viewport here. Otherwise, it will limit cap it at that. So if you are doing nice simulations, you do want to turn that off to make sure you see everything all the detail in the viewport there. So that's uh, another quite important thing to remember. So there we go, let's see if that works a little quicker. So um, the other thing that's interesting here is this cooling rate. This is how fast sort of the flames cool down as they rise. So the way the flames work is obviously we have temperature. Temperature um, is effect, uh, creates a buoyancy and that buoyancy then creates a velocity which moves it in the direction that we say and the buoyancy is driven by here if we open up by gravity I mean if I just change the direction of uh, gravity to maybe off to the X there we'll see it shoots off <laughs> into the side direction for us that's a bit odd let's make gravity minus one and um, the buoyancy can make it rise quicker and slower so if I put a higher buoyancy in you'll see it rises faster and if I put a, a small buoyancy in it doesn't rise very much just kind of evolves around here a bit. Um, let's maybe put a slightly higher buoyancy in, maybe 0.6 or something. Um, the other thing that can affect it rising is how quickly it cools down, this cooling rate. So if we put a high cooling rate in, you'll see it bangs, it explodes here, but then it doesn't rise up so quick. You know, it cools down and sort of disappears faster. If I have a very low cooling rate, You'll see the heat stays within it quite a lot, and um, it will keep rising a lot more. As you see, there you go, it's much more effervescent. It heats up a lot further and rises further. So um, let's maybe uh, coil this down by putting something 
in I really want quite a quick explosion that cools down or disappears quite quickly maybe 0.98 let's have a higher number in there so I want a nice big bang and then I want it to kind of just disappear quite quickly and leave some smoke hanging around so the other thing we can do is this uh, play with some temperature again this is the uh, temperature it tries to achieve the reference temperature and uh, this is the ambient temperature of the air around in Kelvin so if I make this smaller you'll see it's a lot less hot you know it doesn't burn so hot and as a result it doesn't rise so quick and look we are cooling it down quite quickly so it hardly rises at all but if I make that very hot then it's going to produce a lot of heat and uh, even though it's cooling quickly it's still going to rise up quite a lot faster so we can make it much more flammable there kind of thing so if some things burn a lot ho hotter and faster then you can raise that reference temperature and give an idea of that so you see a lot of these things adjust how quickly it rises up and also how quickly it disappears or loses its energy and that's kind of what you can control in this part so um, that's kind of uh, my initial explosion there so maybe uh, cool that down even more which is like 99% of the temperature over a second, the cooling rate. Not sure if it tells you that there, but it, it is. Um, next, uh, we can go to this flames tab. So again, we can control how far these flames live for. At the moment, they're kind of uh, living to there. If I make this really small, um, they won't go up so high. So the flames just disappear before they even go anywhere. So again, we can control how far the flames appear to uh, exist for. So I'm just going to bring that down a little, so they kind of pop up, maybe 2.5. So they're very quickly and then they disappear. So you get this initial bang, and then our flames kind of pop upwards. Now it's hard to tell the sense of speed here. You can actually turn on frames per second. If you tap D, or again choose the eyeball here, you can go to the uh, guide section and turn on draw FPS. And just see it down there, 120 FPS. So this isn't very quick at all. <laughs> well, it is when there's nothing displaying. As soon as I have to display the explosion, it goes slow. Well, the best way to get an idea, obviously, is to uh, flip book it, really. Um, you know, just to right click and do a flip book. Let me just uh, turn the size off. I don't like that very much. I like the size of this window here. And then we can see it in real time when we play it back. We know this is definitely going to be 24 FPS. It gives us a sense of the explosion there. So it the, just pops in very quickly and just burns up a bit faster. Let me maybe make that a bit more buoyant. So even though it burns up quick, it just rises up a bit more as it disappears. Yeah, something like that might be good. So after playing with the flame's lifespan here, which you can shrink or grow, um, we can add some smoke. Let's turn on and emit smoke. And then we get some smoke um, being emitted from those flames. And you see the smoke fades off over time. We can uh, affect this. Now it doesn't look very good. Let me just stop it here. Whenever you're doing the pyro really, what you need to do is add a light. So I'm just going to come up here and just add a spotlight. And instantly we see we get some nice shading. And it gives us a good sense of the noise that we're trying to, uh, that, we're, that we're getting in our smoke here. So instantly that makes it look a bit better and more contrasty. So we can adjust the smoke, how it uh, gets emitted here. So at the moment we're using this merge method. So we've got some density already and we're going to add more density based on um, this threshold. So within the flame field, so remember we've got to have a flame field air in there. So within the flame field's range between 0.1 and 0.8, we're going to map this. So And uh, at 0.1, so when the flames cool, we're not going to add density. And when it's hot, above 0.8 we're not going to add density but in between those values we're going to add density so somewhere mid between those that's when the most density is going to go in there and um, if this is adding a value and there's already a, a value in the voxel um, it will just use the maximum value it won't although we could add it but you could accumulate too much density so uh, max tends to be a slightly better option so we can control that but how do you know kind of the ranges that you might want for your fields well there's a visualizers that we can use if you go to the um, where are we? If we go to the uh, setup tab here, we have these visualizers, and look, we can turn on show the flame field. So if I come out a little bit, let's go around uh, this side. We can see our flame field happening for us in the scene there. So yeah, that's probably the best side to go. Let's put the uh, lighting back on. 
So if we zoom in there, we can find out a range. If you click on Modify Flame, it brings up the controls for the visualizer here. And uh, you've got minimum, maximum. You can change the color, actually. You don't have to have black body. You could do something like this, uh, the infrared. And that you can find out your maximum and minimum values. So if I can find out that my peaking red values here are about one point. Well, yeah, they're about one, aren't they, really? Let's go back and play the sim. So at the very hottest there, it's just about, it is about one. It's maxing, or one point, one point one, one point two. Yeah, about one point one. So 1.15 something like that and then it's cooled down already by then so if you want to see the range we were um, doing our smoke for if you remember that was between um, say 0.1 and 0.8 so now we're seeing the uh, these are the ranges between those so the mid value would be where we're um, emitting most of the smoke so the mid value between 0.1 and 0.8 would be about 0.4-ish, something like that. So let's do 0.4 to 0.5. So that's most of the range. That's where we're getting the smoke being emitted from. So you can use these visualizers to kind of get a really good idea of um, what's going on in your smoke and the ranges that you're doing. So let me just turn that off. And we can also do one for the temperature. We come over here. We can also see the temperature and we can also modify the temperature field. Again, we've got infrared there. So I can see that the uh, temperature at this point is about 0.4. So it's got quite cool. And at the beginning there, oh, the temperature's um, just under 1, about 0.8 or something. We're maxing out on the temperature. Cool. So that gives you some information that you know about your particular pyro sim. And um, you can obviously add more as you go along. So if we look at the temperature there, we can see that we're um, it's getting quite cool by the time we get to the end here. Excellent. So let's go back to solving here. Um, so what I might want to do is have the smoke not being so much when it's cooling down. So we'll put 0 0.3 here. So it still has to be quite warm to emit the smoke there. And I think I'll leave it at that. Uh, actually, no, let's do... Uh, yeah, we'll leave it at that so we don't get too much smoke. We'll notice it's fading off. We'll fix that in a minute. Um, but we get enough smoke here, we can always come back and adjust this. The other thing we can do is adjust temperature. Again, we can add more temperature to the equation here. So again, it's adding temperature only where it's kind of really hot between 0.6 and 0.1. Um, we could bring that down a little bit and we'll keep adding temperature a bit longer in the sim. So again, we can keep some more temperature occurring a bit longer. And you'll see it rises up a bit higher. If I put that to zero. It'll keep adding. It's not adding much. It's adding 0.1 here. But you'll see it just adds. It keeps it going a little bit further up into the clouds there. So let's uh, maybe put this to 0.1 or something. 0.2. And then um, we've got expansion here. This is interesting. This is uh, otherwise known as divergence. And this can get it to expand and contract. Um, if I put a minus number in, you'll see it kind of sucks inwards which is quite uh, an interesting effect. And if I put a positive number in, don't go too crazy with this one. Again, you'll see it puffs outwards. Because that nice puffiness to it. So let's put a nice, uh, a bit of a bigger number in there. And again, there's a field driving this puffiness. Gives you that very mushroomy cloud effect. So let's put two in for fear of going too crazy. And again, it's using the flame range here between where it's the hottest, 0 0.6 and 0 0.1. Uh, we know our flame went actually slightly hotter than that. Let's maybe put 1.1 1 .1 in. And then only where it's really the hottest, so 2.5. Let's go back to frame one for that quickly. You see down the bottom here, it puffs outwards. So um, it's using, let me just show you this quickly. If we just pop over to sourcing, Again, um, this is the uh, fields that we're actually using from the rasterize here. Look, burn, temperature, and velocity. Even though it says density, we're not using that. It's bringing in zero. But there it's bringing in temperature. That's the name that we call it here, temperature. And this is the name that the solver needs. So you can't, can't change this name, but these can be custom names. So you can bring in lots of different temperatures if you really want to. And look, there it's bringing in our burn, but it has to be called flame. 
And look, it's actually using the burn again for the divergence. Let's create our own custom divergence field that's got sort of random divergence more related to our explosion. So we'll see puffiness along the uh, lines that we've blasted outwards rather than sort of this more mushroomy puffiness based around the burn field. So I'm going to create a field called divergence. So let me just copy this name and paste it here. So now we're going to load in um, potentially a, a field called divergence. But we don't have one. We don't have a field here called divergence. So again, this pyro burst source node can make it for us. Let me go back to where we've got some sourcing. I'm going to go to the components here. And so I can see what's going on. I'm going to turn off the burn. And I'm just going to turn off the temperature. If you click on the little plus, you can make a third tab. And look, let's create something. We don't want density. Um, let's create some divergence. And look, it's given it the name divergence already. So that's handy. And you'll see it's fading off like we've told it to across the trail and across the duration. And um, what I want to do is on my divergence is let's add a bit of that noise to it just to break it up again like we did before. 0.5 so it's not totally zero. I'll just scale up the noise again to 0.5 so it's just kind of, we get these areas here, it's going to expand a lot, it's not going to expand very much here. It won't expand at the tips which is quite good but mostly in the body there it will. So um, let's see uh, the effect of that. Now don't forget to turn back on your temperature and your burn, otherwise there will be no pyro. And uh, we'll click back on our pyro solver here. Now we don't need to update the um, volume rasterize here. If you look, we now have a divergence field. And look, it's filled it out for us because this is connected um, automatically, which is pretty handy. So um, down here we have our divergence. Let's see if that's affected anything. Oh, there you go. That's made that a little bit more puffy. It's certainly um, made it more puffy, which is kind of the effect that I wanted there. So here's my divergence. So if we add a bit more divergence, if I set that to maybe 30, um, we'll see that gets a bit more crazy. As it, but it'll only exaggerate it in the areas that we said. There we go, it puffs out a lot more. Let me bring this back down to 10 again. So remember, we've also got velocity. I like to sort of mess up the velocities more. I'm going to exaggerate my velocity here a bit more. I'm going to set this to maybe 50 and the scale to 1. Uh, let's see the effect of that. Because remember, we had all these random or slightly more randomized velocities along the trails. There you go. Look, that's really kind of stirred it up a bit. So this is really amplifying those. Uh, if you remember on the pyro source it and the output attributes, I added velocity noise. Now we're kind of seeing that coming through and spinning things around here. Let me set the deceleration strength to zero there. See what effect that has. I'm just um, not making it too, not too much, not making it too crazy. So we'll bring that in. Let's maybe add some more of the divergence back in because we're losing some of that because of this uh, velocity there. Look, that's looking a bit more energetic and puffy in the middle there. Get some interesting bits shooting out. Maybe let's have a bit more divergence. Well, divergence, remember, is based along um, these guys here, you know, based based upon the actual pyro burst source instead of just where it was burning before. It's got a much more interesting initial explosion with some of these puffs coming outwards. Excellent. Right, I'm starting to like that. Let's. Um, we've done our expansion. We've done our temperature and smoke and our simulation. We've added a bit more of a divergence field. Um, let's just drop the resolution a little bit to. Uh, Let's put 0.15 just to see. We'll go a little bit slower. But we'll see a little bit more detail up here in our smoke, which is starting to look interesting. I realize it's a little short now. Let's maybe 35 so it goes higher. Or um, maybe we can just bring down the uh, buoyancy a little bit. Maybe the buoyancy back to 0.6. Just so it doesn't rise up so much, the smoke there. So the next interesting thing is um, here in shape. Um, the look tab really is just for how it looks in the viewport. We'll talk about that in a moment. But let's talk about the shape here. Let's just turn off these noises. So in shape, it basically disturbs the velocity field and um, to create all those extra noises for you. Otherwise, you get this quite, as you can see here, quite a smooth looking uh, simulation. Now, the dissipation is exactly what it says on the tin. It dissipates over time. So again, based on the temperature field here. So that where the temperature is zero, we're going to dissipate the most. 
when the temperature is hot we're not going to hardly going to dissipate so it's just going to fade off this smoke over time I don't really want this smoke to fade off like that because uh, if it was an explosion it's quite heavy so I'm going to really put that down low so it will eventually fade off but hopefully now we'll just get these clouds hanging around for all our 75 frames so there you go they kind of disperse a little bit but there you go that's kind of nice so next the uh, funky one is this disturbance field let's click on disturbance here as soon as I turn that on you'll see it disturbs the velocity field and we get this lovely noise sometimes you get this shredding um, some of the the issue for that can be is often that your um, block size here your noise is too small or you um, yeah, your noise is too small you're trying to push this around too much so um, we can affect that um, quite happily here so um, one of the ways we can do that is uh, we can increase the block size <laughs> so we're not trying to get such small shapes let me go back to frame one otherwise it will just add it in there so if we look now we're going to lose some of the artifacting Again, the hour class filtering um, can help with this, but I ideally the best thing you really need to do is just drop your res down and um, really to see um, if the artifacts go away, because it's generally a resolution thing. Plus, you're just pushing around the field a bit too much sometimes. But look, as I increase the resolution there, we're not seeing so much of those artifacts. Get away with it a bit more. Um, you can when you're using the sparse solver if you do see it where is it um, in the uh, advanced tab here you can use hourglass filtering this is designed to help remove some of these artifacts but um, we can't use that with the minimum uh, solve unfortunately uh, let's go back to our shaping but that's fine so um, we want to play with some of these uh, densities. So what it's doing, it's using this threshold field, the density field, and only when the density is below this value is it going to start to mess up our velocity field for us. And it's doing it on a block-based method. We can do continuous, so we're getting kind of a continuous, um, that's the continuous mode. So it's adding it sort of a, a noise in there, again based on this reference scale, which you can change to get bigger or smaller. It's just trying to exaggerate the existing verticals that are in there. So you can see it get quite a nice a nice little motion going there as it just softens everything up nice and fluffy so if we put a, uh, a bigger reference scale in see the effect of that get different shapes appearing in our noise here so you might like that kind of look or if you choose the block base, this is more of a fractal base type of noise. Where we've got the uh, size here. If I put a big size in, let's put four in. You'll, you'll see the noise pattern that we've got. And again, we can change the. We've got sort of three levels of noise here, but you can add more if you want. And uh, you can change the uh, roughness, which kind of fades in those noise levels. But there you go. You see, it's a more of a typical of a, a kind of swirliness that you might get with cigarette smoke. And the speed of which it evolves is generated by this pulse length. And you'll see it's constantly evolving the whole time. So you can change the sort of the shapes of your noises here. Now, um, remember, it's st disturbing the v an existing velocity field. So as soon as you start stirring that up, it's going to keep stirring. Now, what's interesting is we can use control fields to manipulate this stuff as well. So um, if you look at this is set to speed, we go to the simulation tab. You'll see we are actually calculating a speed field up here. And we can use that to perturb um, our noise. So at the moment, um, if I, uh, we're at zero here, we're going to obviously it's a linear relationship. So at zero speed, we're not going to get any disturbance, and at two, we're going to get uh, a lot of disturbance. I'm actually going to put that a lot higher because uh, it's probably moving a lot quicker. We should just stretch that ramp out. So more, it'll have to move faster for us to see some motion here. So as it starts to slow down up in the air here, we're going to get less of that noise. So it'll stop it stirring up so much once it comes to rest. Otherwise, it can look a little bit too energetic. We have got a lot of energy going on there in there at the minute. So let me put that up to a really high number. And then only when it's moving the really quickest and we've got low density, we're going to see those swirls. So that we don't see so many swirls in here because it's um, 
we're cutting it off so we need the real sort of um, fastest areas that we get in it fast and thin areas so you can kind of fade things in and out with that let's put that to five let's put this block size back to um, 0.3 I think that's quite a good size for this let's see just um, how that evolves for a minute and again once we drop our resolution down or just sparse that should look quite nice so uh, another thing we can do to break this up let's just turn that off for a minute is shredding so if you like the disturbance was affecting the density the shredding basically affects the flame the uh, again the velocity field but it's using the flame it's using the heat the the uh, the uh, burn field really to do that and again between these ranges 0.1 and 1 we knew ours was actually about 1.1 so I'll just adjust that. So again, it's adding noise to the uh, down here into the um, flames, into the velocity at the, where the flames are the most down in the heat there, rather than up in the cool density. So we, let's put a big number here, like 20, so we can see an effect of that. So you'll see it was quite smooth to begin with. Now um, we should see a little bit of more jittery or noisiness going on in here. Let me make the block block size a bit bigger. See if we can make that a bit more obvious. So there's a bit more noise. We want to look in the bright areas. So if I put maybe a hundred in, we'll see definitely some shimmering. So that you see here, you can see um, lots of more variation and sort of more of a swirly effect going on in there. I might have to just drop the resolution. So we can do something like that, just so we can see that initial down there. You'll see there's a lot more dottiness and variation here, especially on this frame 20. Whereas if I turn the uh, shredding off, we we'll just jump to frame 20 again. You see, it was quite puffy, and we had all those sort of bright colours. Now it's much smoother. See how it just all breaks all that up. So let's maybe uh, put this back to 20. We're not that too crazy. So it's, it's not as smooth as we just saw on frame 20, but you'll see we've got these little puffs. You know, it's broken that up now. Much smaller little puffs going on in there, which is kind of good. Um, if we add that to the disturbance, because remember they're both, both affecting the velocity field together, you know, that's going to create a different kind of initial thing to begin with because it's all shredded here it's not able to rise up so much and again it will give us a different field for our um, shred our disturbance to shred up and we get a quite a, a different look to that so it's really about fine-tuning all of these one at a time the turbulence itself just adds a general turbulence over everything let's just turn that on so um, again it's based on the density field Ooh. You see that using that as a control field, um, but it's uh, the temperature is what's causing it. So in s where the temperature is uh, below this range, we're going to start to get our swells, our um, turbulence in there. Let's put a high value in there so we can see just a general noise over everything. It's not really dictated by the thinness or the small or the heat or the density. It just creates a noise over everything. You see, it just kind of bulges it all out. In all different directions. Let's make the swirls. Let's make the swirls a little smaller, and then uh, we'll see how those look. So again, here's the influence field. So when the temperature is below this value, then this will kick in. So as it cools down, we start to see that turbulence in there. Again, you can see we've got smaller swirls. Maybe let's make those smaller. It smaller again. So at the pulse length is how quick these swirls change. Smaller numbers change faster or evolve faster. So that we'll see in smaller details in there. Again, depending on the swirl size that you want. I'm going to put that back to 5 and have this quite small, actually. And let's punt, put everything else back on there. So let's run that through and see what we um, have got. There we go, that looks interesting. So what I'll do is um, I'll just do a quick play blast and I'll pause the video while this happens and then we can see how that looks in a moment. 
that has now um, flip booked and if I run that through we can see we got our big quick explosion and then we just turn into lots of smoke which rises up towards the end there and that's kind of the effect um, I think I was after so um, again I'm not I'm gonna fine-tune this a little bit more once we have our um, house in there so um, the next thing I want to do is to actually drive the house explosion with that and then feed back the house as a collision to this pyro here so it looks like it's hitting the walls so you know the two of them will hopefully look like they're a bit tied up together if you recall we've set up our house here for our rigid bodies let me just uh, come down here and um, we've got our pyro burst source banging outwards there and this has got loads of velocities on on it and if you remember we actually created a piece of geometry here with some velocities on it um, which we then w transferred in after using a point wrangle um, which worked out the uh, impact for us based on basically the uh, size or the magnitude of the velocity there and uh, we scaled those up here so um, we could pretty much do the same thing all we really need to do is plug in our burst source to this wrangle and that's going to give us some numbers but they're going to be different to what we started with uh, so I'll give you an example if I bring up the spreadsheet here let's just filter this list let me type impact here so we just see the impact and we can see the biggest the uh, impact came to was about 15,000 so if I plug in my pyro burst source now so let's see what kind of numbers we're dealing with with that so we said 15,000 so here we've got um, 186,000 so it's nearly by the order of 10 so we're gonna have to uh, consider that when we start doing stuff with this so in my uh, impact scale here let me bring that down maybe to instead of an order of 10 let's do half let's do 500 or something because remember these are only like the highest ranges it's probably the mid range is somewhere a bit lower than that so uh, let me just bring that let's see where we where we go with 500 for now so we're still uh, feeding in those attributes the velocity here and uh, if you remember we're reading the impact down here in our little um, VOP expression down here we're reading the impact force in so let's see the change of that now I'm gonna use this null just plugged into this third input here um, oh, there we go it's gonna run up to frame 6 for us rather than the RBD IO if you remember we cached it out so it's not gonna quite be the same and look there we go oh and look you can already see the um, bits of the house are flying off in directions relating to um, that explosion there look we're getting them all in different directions so that's kind of working isn't it so uh, what I really want to do is maybe um, flip book this up quickly so uh, again let me just run the flip book going so I'll just pause the video while that runs and then we can see how that looks there you go that's flip booked up and wow that's a little bit insane it's a little bit crazy there I think my velocities are a bit mad so let me scale those down so um, yeah let's put this uh, maybe 0.08 isn't small enough let me put something like 0.5 in so yeah my lights around the wrong way here let me go look through the light and lock it to the camera let me just come around the other side here so it just looks a little bit better when we uh, come down the front oh, what's going on with the spotlight there why has it gone bright right, let's just lock that in again it's probably too close there we go let's come back down to the house so um, again if I just run forwards we can see how um, energetic our explosion is I'll we'll just give it a second to um, jump in there and then I've turned it down to 0.5 and okay that's kind of interesting but again it looks like things are just being blown out maybe a little too far what's really nice actually if we look at the cache is um, so on the first frame here let me just hide that a sec you can really see just turn the shadowing off you can really see sort of what everything breaking up in their particular materials like the glass and the wood there exploding out how they should so but unfortunately it goes a bit 
wild. I don't know if the explosion would really blow them out that far away. So let me maybe try this at, at point 0.3. And uh, I wonder if the attribute transfer will have an effect here. Now that'll just make things uh, a bit closer. So we'll just bring that force down to point 0.3. See if that comes down a bit. So it looks a little bit more realistic for how far they go. So we just have to see how far everything gets blown out there. So remember, we've got some very light things made of glass and wood, and we've got some very, very heavy things. And that's exploding it like crazy. So I'll just try uh, one last reduction, maybe a tenth of the... Uh oh, hang on a sec. Do you notice it's not actually updating? Maybe it didn't see the change there. Notice when I change this, it's not actually removing the cache here. So I must remember to go back to the solver here and turn off Reset Sim or rather click on Reset Sim. You can actually turn the cache off if you go into the um, Advanced tab. So if I go into the Advanced tab here and open up, um, is it dot .network? Open up the dot .network tab. There we go, you can turn off the cache here and then it will always update without remembering. But if you've got the cache on you, sometimes it doesn't remember to remove it because um, this was too far upstream really. So there we go, so that's coming through. That still looks a bit crazy. But some of our bigger pieces aren't flying so far away. So what we can do is probably rein this in by using a, uh, a clamp expression. So what we can do is clamp these velocities from being too insane. So um, what we'll do is we'll write a little clamp expression here to do that. So I'm going to say v at v equals. Um, and we'll say clamp and then we want to give it the original value to clamp, so that'll be v. Uh, ooh, excuse me, where's um, what's going on there? So v at v, and then we want to give it um, the range to clamp it between. So we'll, we'll create a, a channel vector here, and we'll call this uh, min range, and then we want to give it uh, also choose the max range. So let's make sure we can get all the right number of brackets in. Let's click the magic button up the right here to get our uh, ranges here. And again, I want these to be the same to clamp the velocity. So let me just paste a relative reference. So I'm going to copy the max x here and then paste that into the max y and the max z. So they're always the same. And uh, let's try minus uh, 9 by 9 then. We're limit limit limiting this to um, 9 by 9 in the velocity. So it can go sort of a minimum of minus 9 and plus 9 either way around, but no faster than that. So let's see if that um, helps at all. So I still get the uh, s s slower speeds, but not the super, super crazy ones. So already we can see that's reined it in a bit. So we don't know what kind of what ranges we need. I'm doing it based on uh, eyeballing it. So yeah, there you go. They're, they're not so wild shooting outwards. And we can obviously scale this up with the velocity scale, but it's going to hit the clamp for us. So uh, 9 by 9 looks pretty good. Just shoving stuff out to a nice-ish distance. But obviously not going to get stuff that um, goes too wild away there. So if we put maybe but 10 by 10. So again, it hasn't... Uh, let me hit Reset Sim because the cache didn't disappear. And you'll see we're allowing things to shoot and blast out a little bit further there. But it means a lot of things are going to get the same velocity, obviously, here at the top there. We could put some variation in there so we didn't see everything clipping out. That's why you kind of get a flat top here, because all these guys are getting the same velocity as they hit the top of the clamp. So we could add a little bit of noise in there. Look, there's some pieces breaking away. So that could be good for um, what we want. kind of want to obliterate the house like that. Excellent, let's see it totally destroyed there in our 75 frames. So that should, um, in theory, tie up a little bit to our explosion there. I mean, if I look on the explosion here, again, we've still got this on the um, minimal solve. So we're in wireframe. Let me tap W to see the explosion there. And we can kind of see this 
with respect to the house if we go to the house so um, what I'll do is I'll just uh, flipbook that and see how that looks so I'll pause the video while that flipbooks there you go that's finished so if I press play we can see um, it kind of ties together quite nicely we do get the feeling that explosion blew up the house well it kind of did the sourcing is what's destroying the house there and we used our little clamp trick to um, restrict the, the velocities in there. We could put some randomness per piece in that clamp, per point, just to um, vary it a bit. So not everything was the same, but I think it looks um, okay at this point. That looks pretty cool. So yeah, what, I've, what I think I'm quite happy to do now is to actually write this cache out again. I don't think I'm going to change that sourcing. So I'm going to write out my cache here again. So this will be version 2. House Explode version 2. So we'll just hit save to disk. So that shouldn't take too long while it caches up. Um, the reason I want to cache it up is because uh, I want to use its geometry in a moment, um, particularly to create a collision surface for our pyro solver here. So it looks like um, when it explodes, it actually collides with the walls there. So um, what I'm going to do is just uh, pause the video while this finishes caching out. That's now finished caching out, so if I look at this null after the RBD IO, we should see our new um, explosion happening there. Yep, there we go, so that's um, reading the cache back from disk. So we've asked it, asked it to uh, do that there. So what I want to do now is um, create a collision surface a uh, collision geometry for this guy here so at the moment we've got it on the uh, minimal open cl solve and uh, here's the collider frame range uh, it's going to load in a collider for us uh, before i do that let's actually turn this off let's turn off the minimal open cl solve if we go to the setup we'll see actually the collision options have changed and it's asking for a collision source this generally wants to consist of a collision volume plus um, a surface describing the velocities. Um, but how do you make these things? Well, it's quite, the clue's really there. It says collision source. So lucky for us, there is actually a collision source node. Let me choose collision source node. So I'm going to plug in the actual geometry out of my RBD IO into the collision source node. And this will make out the first input. Let me stick a, a null in there. So out the first input here, we get our um, collision surface with our velocities on it sort of the V attribute. And then out of this second input here, let's look at that one. This is where we get our collision volume. And this is uh, more the important one. So there's the collision volume here. And you'll see actually at the moment it's not really uh, working very well. We don't have the top defined. So look, we can change that here with this resolution. Let's maybe try 0 0.05. And uh, see if that gives us a slightly better, a better res there. There we go. We can fill that in. That looks a little bit better. So um, that, that should work for us in this case. And um, ideally, if you actually look on the solver here, here we have the collision voxel size. Let me put this to 0.05 as well. These should match up. So this should always be sort of the same as that there. Um, and this should always be smaller, ideally, than what you're um, solving. Otherwise, uh, you might get some artifacts. Now, this can be quite slow to calculate, as you saw. I mean, if I jump forwards in the cache to where it starts to explode. Interesting, it's not doing the glass, but that's fine. The glass will explode anyway. So there you go, looks, pre looks, looks, looks pretty ugly. Let's maybe drop this to 0 0.04. But that's fine, it will do as a collision. We only really want to the initial bit there. So there you go, see that as um, the surface it will collide with. So what you basically do is you merge these two inputs together like this, let me get rid of those nulls and then uh, we feed that into the simulation itself here so um, that's going to try and calculate all those frames for me let's wait for it to go to frame 6 that didn't work that time so um, we're using the sparse solve here so let me just go back to frame 1 oh, I'm getting lots of errors, that's really good let's click in here, 0 0.04 let's wait for it all to evaluate again there we go. So let me just step forward uh, a couple of frames. 
So this is going to be slow because this collision source takes um, quite a while to process. So what I'll do in a moment actually is cache this out to disk. Uh, just make sure it's working first and then we'll cache out the uh, Pyro Simple Fireball as well at high res when we're done just to see what we get. And that will take a, a bit of a while. So what I'll do is I'll certainly stop the video while we do that. So uh, let's move forwards. Another frame. It's not as quick as the um, OpenCL preview. There we go. So look, as we come in, oh look, there we go. We can see there's definitely some collision happening here. You can see the shape of the walls. Let me uh, turn on the uh, template there. But you can see the shape of the walls and you can see the flames come through the window there. It's also come through the walls a little bit because uh, this is a bit hacky. If you have a look, my pyro burst source is actually coming through the walls. So we will be birthing fuel and stuff through here. But um, if you look, the house is kind of blown up at that point. Um, the, the, these don't collide with the walls here. And um, if I was doing a particle sim, like I said, I'd probably do it all within the same network so these things did all interact more correctly. But um, this is a bit of a hacky way, trying to do it all in SOPs. Um, there is a nice little trick that I um, like to do, actually, is if you think about it, the flames here are coming in um, probably a little too early. And if we scroll forwards, yeah, they come in a little too early. Uh, if we had a time shift node, what we can do with the time shift node actually is uh, here in the time, I can minus one. So I'm just taking it back one frame. So there we really see the explosion at that point. That might tie up better. If we kind of offset the explosion, so it happens a little bit later, that could often uh, help fix this little issue. It is a bit hacky, but you know, if I wanted proper coupled behaviour, I would spend the effort doing it all inside a proper a, a full-on dot network. So that the house does um, kind of explode on that frame. Mind you, if we do it without the time shift, that's kind of believable, I think. Um, a little trick I like to do with the time shift really is to put it on the source here. So actually we're going to source that little bit later. So let's try it here before we source. So we're actually going to source the pyro a little bit later than what it should. That should give us a slightly different effect there. I'm going to pause the video while I cache this up. That's now cached up. So um, remember I offset the actual pyro source by one frame. So let's see if that looks more interesting. I think in this case I'll probably be alright not doing that because we want to see the house a bit of flame when it starts to explode. So yeah, sometimes when you see it looking a bit ahead of itself you can add a time shift there. I'm actually going to turn the time shift off in this case. Let me just disable that node with the uh, yellow flag. And to see the sparse uh, is a little slower. If you did want to try collisions um, Remember, this is going to be quite slow to load in. If you do want to try collisions with your um, minimal solve, let me turn the minimal solve back on here. We need to go to the uh, setup tab and look, this is the collider frame range. Let's have it collide for eight frames. Now it's going to take a second because it's going to have to calculate all those eight frames there. So it's going to take a little while to do that, but then I should, once it's done, <laughs> unless I change it, be able to run the solve. But it'll only collide for eight frames. After frame eight, there it won't collide anymore because it won't load in, you know, those changes for us. So we're going to have to wait for that. So I'll just pause the video again while that um, catches up with us. So that's apparently caught up. So um, let me just turn off the uh, display of the house there. Let me press play and let's see if this will load up in the GPU. Might not do because it's quite a high res volume going through there. So hopefully this will work. There we go. Look, we can see it colliding already there at the sides. And now um, you see the collision is not changing. It's got that fixed shape of a house exploded around it. So it's probably not the... Uh, it's a bit quirky. It's probably not the best but it gives us an idea 
what's going on if I just template that. Template the house itself, we'll see what goes on. So even though I'm using the GPU for that, so we've got the explosion inside. You see it definitely collides with the house there. Cool, so um, let's start to cache these things out. So it's, it's real slow to uh, keep calculating this guy. So um, what I'll do is I'm going to add a uh, ROP geometry output. Let's stick that in. It's a bit old school this, but that's fine. Um, let's give this a name. Let's call this... Um, uh, what's a good name to call it? Let's call it House Call Vol or something. So let's call this... Um, House Call Vol. number one. So we want our frame range of our 75 frames here. And to read that in, I'm going to create a file node actually, here. And um, what I like to do is I like to copy the parameter on the output file here and I like to paste the relative reference in the file so it's definitely reading the same thing in. Let's plug that in into our pyro instead. And I like to give these a similar color so I know that they work together. This will give me an error until we write something out, but it's definitely going to write read in whatever this has written out. And uh, I'm actually going to do the same. Let me just copy these nodes, just paste them in. Let's do the same for our pyro down here. So again, on this guy, let's call that um, let's call that pyro version, whatever it is. So pyro version one. underscore version one there we go so we've got the same thing here that's all good and then this guy let me just make sure copy parameter on this guy and make sure this has the right expression in there because it's looking at the other ROP so paste relative reference there we go so that should be looking at the right ROP here so we want to cache both of these out so let me just save so again I'm just gonna save this to disk and uh, I'm gonna pause the video while that happens and then um, in fact well tell you what I'm gonna um, yeah, I'll pause the video while it happens. Right, that now that has cached up, if I click on the file node, you see that's um, loaded in these combined geometries for us. If we run through, we can see that's um, moving through a lot quicker. That means if we uh, did, s uh, now that we've got this set to uh, the OpenCL Solve, let me turn that off. Oh. We turn the templating back on this. There we go. This should go a little bit quicker now because it um, be faster to load that in without having to recalculate it. So that will improve our performance for tuning this um, if we want to with our pyro like that. So we can see that explosion ripping through the house now. Excellent. Okay, so what I'd like to do now is um, cache this out properly. For that I will stop the video and then we'll come back once it's done. So for this I'm going to... Um, drop my voxel size maybe let's go for five five um, centimeters this is five centimeters this house is like a couple of meters high so five centimeters will probably be enough resolution um, for this without creating too much disk space the other thing I must do actually is go to um, where is it sourcing advanced let's turn off the minimal open seal solve um, and let's go to simulation let's turn on single projection um, with the advection type, this will give us uh, more fidelity in the um, vortices that we might see. It just helps it look a little bit better. We don't get that again with the um, sp the uh, minimal solve. So uh, again, I'm just going to save, and then I'm going to write out um, this guy to disk, which is going to take a while. So I'll actually stop the video for that, and then we'll come back um, once that's done. So, um, is there anything else I wanted to do actually while we're at it? Um, no, I think that's good. I think the time shift, I don't need the time shift. Okay, so yeah, I'm going to set that off. So let's hit save to disk and uh, I'll see you when that's done. That cache is now completed and um, I flip booked it up to have a look. And uh, I'm not that keen actually on it, even though I waited. Uh, for it to uh, finish. Um, what I'm going to do actually is tweak it now using the open CL solver, the minimal 
CL solver just to not have to wait a couple of hours for the full on cash. I don't like these shooty out little bits and I'm looking it's looking like the disturbance is a bit too much and maybe the um if we look at the initial flame there, maybe the shredding's a little bit extreme as well. So I'm gonna go back and make a couple of tweaks, but we'll do instead of waiting for the full on solve, we can do that quickly using the uh minimal solve. So here I'm gonna click on the minimal solve tab to uh, turn that on and I might actually run out of RAM because um, I left the resolution really high. So um, I want to see it at a similar res to what I was solving here. Actually is that going to work uh, at 20 by 20? Let me step forward a frame and see if the little console pops up telling me I've run out of RAM. Um, I probably have to decrease the max size down to keep the uh, voxels there because I think I'm just on my limit. Um, Yep, it looks like I am. So uh, what I might do is uh, pause the video for a second and um, see if that will just free up the memory for me. Oh, there we go. Almost immediately up came the uh, console. Tell me I've run out of uh, VRAM. So let me just put the uh, resolution up high. I definitely know I've got enough RAM for that res. Let's bring this size Let's cap it down to 15 by 15 and I'll probably be able to drop this a lot lower. There we go, let's see if I can uh, press play now. And uh, Oh, that's better, it's kicking in. So um, at least this is playing nice and quick now. It's not going to give me what I want. I've got those t shooty bit, outy bits um, coming out too much. So what I'll do is just stop that for a second. And uh, let's just come out a little bit so we can see a bit further. So you've got to find that sweet spot for your RAM and your resolution and your size um, just so you can fit it all on your GPU RAM. So uh, what did I say I wanted to do? That's right, I want to go to sourcing first. And uh, what I want to do is just bring down the velocity a little bit. Let's maybe bring this to uh, 35. Let's put the deceleration to zero. So we'll put it to 35, so a bit less velocity in there. And um, I don't like doing more than one or two things at a time because you never know what's really affecting it. Um, but what I will do is bring down my um, disturbance a little. Let's stick this to maybe 35. Let's see how that goes. Um, what I'll do is I'll flip book that up and uh, we'll see what it looks like with these settings. So I'll just pause the video while I do that. Oh, uh, that just play blasted and uh, or flip booked. And uh, I ran out a bit of RAM at the end there when we started the recording again. But um, oh, let me just get rid of that error. But um, I can see that playing through and that looks a bit better. I'm not getting such those crazy little things shooting out. Um, let me just stop that for a second. And um, yeah, it's, I think that's looking a little bit better. I still think my disturbance is a little strong. So um, what I might do is go to the uh, Disturbance tab here and um, I'm going to uh, come down to the Control field here. Let's bring that a bit lower. Let's maybe bring that down to 1 so um, it will slow down moving a bit, bit more. Uh, what I might do is turn this remap on and let's just bring that down as a dent. So it's only really going to disturb at the higher speeds and a lot less at the slower speeds. That might uh, bring some of that noise out of it. So um, I'm just going to drop my resolution a little bit there. Let's put that 0.06 because uh, maybe make this 30 in height because I'm losing uh, RAM there. Let me just point, point, uh, put 0.05 similar to the res that I was simming. So after that one last change, um, I'm going to flip book it again. This is a lot quicker because obviously I'm working at a similar res to when I cached it out. And to do a proper cache took a couple of hours, whereas this is taking uh, not that long at all. Um, it doesn't like it when I'm doing the recording at the same time. I'm going to pause the video actually and I'll flip that up and uh, I'll unpause it when, when it's done. Right, that's now um, flip booked up and uh, running through that only took a few minutes. Um, I'm quite like looking like quite liking the look of that now. So I think that's worth me um, spending the time to cache it up properly. So I'm going to go back to my setup here and put this back to 0 0.05. Uh, in fact, let me go to the solving tab and oh, not turn off calculate speed. We're using that. Let's turn off the minimal solve so I won't run out of 
OpenGL errors and uh, I don't need to resize the box because it's going to automatically resize as we saw before so yep, I think I'm happy with all of those settings I'm going to get a, a, a nicer noise now so um, what I'm going to do is actually cache that up for real so um, I'm going to let that cache run this time and then what we'll do is we'll come back in the next video uh, and we'll look at how to render that so um, 